Thank you doubly for coming out tonight in this beautiful weather. <laughs> we are very happy to see you here. My name is Erin Shea and I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. I would just like to briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs like these available to the community. Tonight's guest received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts. She joined the Museum of Modern Art in 1996 as assistant curator and has organized or co-organized a number of exhibitions for MoMA, including Magritte, which is uh, on view now, Picasso, Juan Miro, and Giacometti. So please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Miss Anne Umland. So let, hmm. yeah, let's see. Can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah. All right. So, well, good evening to everybody. And I'll second Aaron's thank you for coming out on this dark and stormy night. It is a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to tell you all a little bit about the exhibition that's currently up at MoMA called Magritte. The Mystery of the Ordinary, 1926 to 1938. So I thought the first image I'm showing you is to pretend that you're standing outside the exhibition entrance and, and looking in at the show. So for starters, is, are the images clear? Because I know the spotlight's on me, but they are fine. Uh, so a for starters, just a few basic facts about this show. It is the first major museum exhibition of Magritte's work to be held in New York City or on the East Coast, for that matter, in over a generation. And it opened at MoMA on September 28th. It's on view through January 12th. <laughs> and you guys who are giggling in the front row are gonna have to stop. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good and enjoy it. And, I, and once I'm, I'm into it, I won't get so distracted by wondering what you're having such a good time about. <laughs> you know, it's, lo it's lonely up here. So um, this is the first show, first museum show of Magritte's work to be held in, in, on the East Coast in over a generation. And it is the first ever to focus exclusively on Magritte's breakthrough years the years when Magritte became Magritte, so to speak. So we took it as sort of a given when thinking about this show that Magritte is an artist that, that everybody knows and many, many people like and enjoy or have enjoyed his images, but they may not necessarily know that they are by Magritte. He is an artist whose imagery has so permeated right, the public con consciousness or public image bank, thanks in large part to the advertising imagery, sort of ubiquitous appropriation of his work. So what we decided we wanted to do was to set out to reclaim, to a certain degree, all those uh, sky-filled eyes and bowler-hatted men in Magritte's name by looking at the moment when they first appeared in his work. So our show begins in 19... 26. This was a moment in Magritte's career where he decided to renounce abstraction. I, I don't know how many of you know that prior to that point, Magritte had actually made quasi-cubist, quasi-futurist, quasi-abstract paintings. And in 26, he decided to return to painting objects in what he described as all their realizable detail. And here I'm showing you the opening gallery of the show it begins with works that he painted in Brussels, where he was from, in 1926 and 1927, in preparation for his first ever one-person show at the Gallery Le Centaur in that city, which he later looked back on and said represented the first exhibition to represent what he truly valued in his art. The show concludes, so this we can do with slides, we couldn't do in the real space, the show concludes, you've just zipped through 13 years of, of Magritte's um, career, concludes in 1938 
which is a historically and biographically significant moment for Magritte, right before the outbreak of World War II. And what you are looking at here in the last gallery of the exhibition is a group of pictures that Magritte created for the great British surrealist collector, Edward James. And so over the course of this 13-year period that we'll be, I'll be talking to you about tonight, you can really see, I think, Magritte inventing himself. So many of the signature images and pictorial strategies that make Magritte the artist that we know today, that, you know, truly one of the great 20th century modern artists were pioneered or originated at this moment in his work. So outside the exhibition, um, and I will end, I'll begin and end with encouraging anyone who hasn't come to see it yet, I hope you will. I know from my experience tonight, it is just a short train trip or drive, drive away. So if you come, you'll see that outside the exhibition galleries proper, we have a whole wall of vintage photographs. Magritte, like many of the artists associated with surrealism, was fascinated by the potential of the camera as a tool or means of revealing or capturing the strange in the everyday. And the selection of photos that we chose out front to, to introduce the show either feature works that you'll see inside in the galleries in the exhibition. So pay careful attention to that um, painting that you see picture on the left of a man in a suit painting a nude woman. If you have really good visual memories, you'll be able to notice some significant differences between this photo, which captures the painting at an earlier state than, than its final form. And then on the right is a picture of Magritte posing for the camera in 1938, wearing what became his signature bowler hat. And the point I'd like to make about this is just to remember that for Magritte, you know, the bowler hat goes on to become synonymous with Magritte himself, but it begins as something that he puts on for the camera. It's like a theater prop. It's like a disguise. It's a way of helping to promote an image of himself as the everyday businessman, like methodical artist, you know, sort of going about the job of painting in this very neutral, deadpan, dispassionate way. But just to think of the hat sort of has no more real connection or to, to Magritte himself, the essential Magritte, than something like the picture of the pipe that we'll talk about later that is uh, a very realistic image of a pipe but is never the same as the real thing. So the show begins, the first picture as you walk into the gallery is this painting from 1927. It's called The Menaced Assassin. And at the time, it, along with this other picture, The Secret Player, were the two largest paintings Magritte had made. And he made them very consciously and deliberately for this first one-person show at the Gallery Le Centaur, which he and his um, cohorts, his accomplices amongst the Belgian surrealists, intended as to introduce him as Belgium's um, leading, I mean, in fact, at that time, only surrealist painter. So The Menaced Assassin is a work that epitomizes, I think, what Magritte's catalog resume author, David Sylvester, once described as this artist's very unique ability to create crystal clear pictures with definitively unclear so that always when you look at a Magritte painting, you can go through it and name every single item in there, clear as light, but there is never a way to add them up to, to create any sort of, to solve a mystery, to create a conclusive narrative, um, to uh, you know, have a scenario that could be described in ordinary. The one thing we do know about this work so it's uh, interesting to remember that Magritte was a great fan of the cinema. He loved going to the movies. He liked the immersive sort of imaginary world of cinema. And when you see this, this picture in real life, it, it has that kind of amplitude and scale of being a stage-like set that you could imaginatively project yourself into. And in fact, what we know, this is a still from a Louis Fouillade movie from 1913 called The Murderous Corpse, 
And we know that Magritte borrowed the position of his two bowler-hatted guys on either side of that doorway from the movie still, where you saw the two assassins on either side of the door about to, um, if, you, if the movie was moving, you would see that in the very next scene they slit the throat of that guy who just was about to stand. But what Magritte does is instead of hooded, hooded assassins, he substitutes these bowler-hatted men who in the movie are representatives of law and order. They're actually the detectives. So their placement is borrowed from the movie, but he's completely changed the role. He's put figures of law and order in the position of assassins, sort of upending um, normative associations with uh, policemen, bowler-hatted men, all those sort of things being figures that, that you, you could trust and putting them into an ambiguous situation. This is, amongst other things, um, one of the very first paintings in which you see the bowler-hatted man step on to Magritte's pictorial stage, so to speak. So that begins in 26. And by the 50s and the 60s, when Magritte looks back to this moment, that's when you begin to see the numerous paintings of bowler-hatted men with probably apples in front of their faces. I don't know how many of you had. They were all over my neighborhood for some years. So also, at the beginning of the show and for inclusion in his exhibition at the Gallery Le Centaur, Magritte created a number of papier collets, collets or pasted paper collages. And I'm showing you two here. You know, on the one hand, it's interesting because this show very much looks at a moment when Magritte is deeply engaged with surrealism, with the surrealist art movement in Paris and with surrealist techniques like collage. And you probably, a number of you know that very famous quote that almost was a, a manifesto for some of the surrealists that um, came from the Comte de L'Entriament, which said, you know, there's nothing so beautiful as the uh, meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine on a, a dissecting table, sort of the way that, that collage pr provided you with a means of, of imaginatively, imaginatively recombining things from the world in surprising, shocking, unexpected ways. So here are these two early Magritte collages. In them, you see him introducing a number of what go on to be his signature motif, these curtains on the one hand, on either side of a picture, which right away tell you this is a world of artifice, right? It is a stage, it is a space of imagination. He's also interested in these landscapes, right, that are sort of everywhere and nowhere. You see on the right-hand side, again, a bowler-hatted man, this time um, cut out of a piece of sheet music, as are these strange kind of chest-like forms that are given tree um, you know, antlers on the left or branches on the right. And those forms Magritte referred to using the word bilboquet, bil which was the French term for a child's cup and ball toy. You know, those you have a stick and you try to catch it. But when Magritte uses this shape, he never depicts it in a conventional way. You never see it um, shown with anybody using it. It's always with this, this standardized form, sort of displaced and used as stand-ins for for trees, for human forms, for architectural elements. The sheet music, so Magritte cuts out um, from a score, a sheet music score, the shapes that you see in the collages. They all come from the same sheet music. It was a score called The Girls of Gothenburg. That was a British musical comedy from the early uh, 1900s that was written in English and German. And so when you look at these collages close up, all the language is in English and German. To Magritte, that would have been absolute gi gibberish. So it's interesting to think, too, later on, when you watch him begin to incorporate language into his painting and to sort of use it in nonsensical ways to think back to these early times and this idea that, that words can play a pictorial role in addition to having a, a semantic connotation. So the work on the, the left is a particularly special one. It's called The Lost Jockey. And Magritte's contemporaries in, in Brussels in 1926 identified that figure 
on a horse racing off into the unknown with the young artist Magritte himself. So not at this point with the staid figure of a bowler-hatted man, but with this very romantic idea of a horse and rider um, galloping at top speed, and yet, as shown in this collage, um, at the same time, um, paradoxically, right, frozen in place and going on. Chorus that is, that is created. So this um, picture, so I'm just showing you, I'm sort of pretending that I'm having the pleasure of walking you through the gallery spaces, which is really the most fun, fun way to see this. I hope I capture a little, a little bit of that. Um, this is a work called The End to Contemplation. It's from 1927, so Magritte is still in Brussels. And it's a work, I think, that shows um, or underscores how important the idea of doubling and repetition was for Magritte as a way of reminding you that pictures of things are always just pictures. They're never the same ever as the thing itself. And here, with these sort of bowl, uh, bald, balding, mannequin-like shop window dummies, it's interesting to note how on the right-hand side, right, their heads are so convincingly modeled. They have a real three-dimensional quality to them, while on the left-hand side, the edge is jagged and almost flat, like a cut-out piece of paper. So on one side, it's as though they just are two-dimensional forms kind of glued onto the picture surface. On the other side, they're occupying space. And Magritte in these early years loves to play with contradictory systems in, in one picture. Again, another way of making sure things don't add up. So this work, too, is a, a funny one in that those white abstract forms in the background that are painted to resemble torn sheets of paper those little black dots that join them are actual snap fasteners, like you'd find um, to hold it, hold a dress closed. So he's playing with perception and with the idea that you actually need to hold his painted white forms onto the canvas in some some physical way. And in later years, Magritte never actually does makes use of literal literal collage or even even assemblage. So this is. And the only other thing I would note about this for, for those of you who yourself is actually I have brought you an incorrectly cropped slide, which drives me crazy. But this picture has, in addition to that black bar that goes right down the center, it has identical ones on, on either on the left and right side. So there are really three black stripes in it and that seem to refer to um, the idea of a stereoscopic image. You know, if you think back to those old cards where they're, they're photos side by side and you look at them through a viewer and they create a three-dimensional illusion. And so Magritte is interested in also these, these um, devices or, or tricky, tricky ways of, of creating three-dimensionality. And I think it's so, even in the catalog resume of this work, they, they crop. Uh, somehow we have done these, these two black abstract stripes off the left-hand side because I think they're so, they're so disconcerting. You know, it's just this, this habit. So, in 1927, in September, uh, Magritte and his wife Georgette move to Paris because Magritte wants to be closer to the center of the surrealist movement and part of a larger conversation. So they pick up and they move themselves there. Of course, with Magritte, never and nothing is ever completely straightforward. So. As with many young artists today who say would move to New York City, they often find that living in Manhattan is not affordable. Magritte found that living in Paris in the center was not an option for him. So in fact, he moved to Paris, but he lived in the suburbs, about 45 minutes outside of the city center in a place called Le, Le Perreau-sur-Marne. And um, I'm showing you two. On the left is what is believed to be the first painting that he completed upon arriving in Paris. It's called Muscles of And if you begin, then you can see a little 
lot of what I've been talking about, about the way that he tricks or pictorial devices like a planted wood floor, right, using perspective to create or along the back of that jagged black shadow um, that you see running across the horizon line. He's picked up highlights on the edge to give it a sort of three-dimensionality. Or he adds shadows behind these strange cloud-like forms that seem to somehow have come out of the sky and walked onto the stage. And again, background on the one hand at the top, there's a real sense of a um, two-dimensional, and yet by popping those figures forward and giving them a shadow, he introduces them. And one of the great things about Magritte being in Paris, I mean, there are many things. He meets all sorts of people, André Breton, Paul Eluard, uh, Louis Aragon. He meets artists like Joan Miro and Max Ernst and Yves Tanguy and eventually Salvador Dali. So he really does realize his ambition of becoming part of a, a larger conversation. At the same time, though, he um, writes many, many letters home to Brussels and particularly to a friend of his called Paul Nuget. And so we have, thanks to those letters, these wonderful sort of eyewitness accounts narrated by Magritte himself where he talks about a number of the pictures he made, goals, aspirations, and the muscles of the sky on the left is one of those pictures which he describes um, as being for him all about this idea of concealment and the way that those strange cloud-like, leg-like forms come down and hide parts of that um, wooden floor. But I know that when you look at that picture, you can think about it in, in opposite terms as being one of the things, right, of, of part of those foreground elements being cut away to reveal the, the sky beyond. I think with Magritte's work, more often than not, you can always find the opposite or a reverse. And then just on the right is another early picture that introduces paper cut out doily-like forms, which become another element in his repertoire that you'll see. So how many people read French? Oh, all of you, good, then you can all. <laughs> so uh, when, when Magritte goes to Paris, one of the things that you begin to see happening is the introduction of, of words into his this is one of my favorites in this show. It's called The Empty Man. It gives you words that designate objects like sky or human body or forest, he tells us, curtain or house facade. But he leaves the creation of the picture of what the images would look like absolutely up to everyone's imagination, yours included. So there's often, too, in the works in this section, such an interest in his part of trying to rethink the relationship between his, his artwork, his pictures, and his audience, and trying to think of different ways that he can provoke um, or encourage the viewer to have, have an active role, to, put, to participate right in part of the, the making of the content of the picture. One other thing that you'll see in, in images throughout the show is this way that Magritte internalizes pictures or references to, f to frames. So here, for instance, you see this um, cut up, right, four part picture. It's almost like a, a window frame. Or if you've ever looked at pictures of an old fashioned artist studio with canvases turned to the wall, the backs of them, often the stretcher bars, look like what you see offset in an irregular way in that picture. You also see Magritte playing with things like a door frame in this, this picture, which on the one hand is very um, naturalistically rendered. The other hand is just this flat, almost Barnett Newman-like zip that goes right down the center of the picture. Or here in this work called Man Reading a Newspaper, you see him playing with the idea of, of framing by dividing the picture up into these separate quadrants um, separated by black lines as though you're looking at a photographic contact sheet, right, or, or film screen. And all of these different ways, think about up until that point from the Renaissance on, what are the two dominant models or conceptions of what a painting could be? 
paintings were thought of as transparent windows onto the world or as these uh, mirrors, right, reflecting what they saw rather passively. The moment that you start putting frames inside pictures, you're, you're creating pictures that comment on picture making, right, that say this is, a, this is about painting. It does not purport to have a transparent relationship to the visible world and in ways that just as effectively negate those, those dominant ideas of painting as something um, that's much more obvious, like say a Kazmir Majevich mon monochrome. It's just trying to propose a new model for what, what paintings could be, have a critical relationship to the um, tradition of painting. So here you see a seated man, most likely modeled on Magritte himself, in the act of painting a nude woman. And this is probably one of his most direct interrogations of just what it means to make a painting. The work where you see the female figure um, so convincingly modeled, it's as though she occupies the same dimensional space as the artist who conjures her up. But by leaving part of her incomplete, if you look up to where he's holding the paintbrush, it's as though he's pointing, he's telling you, pay attention. This is nothing but an illusion, right? I am conjuring this plausible, believable, beautifully illusioned form up out of nothing, right out of just paint on paper. The work is often talked about as being an, an homage to his wife, Georgette Magritte. In fact, it's the only double portrait he ever made of the two of them. And its title is Tentative de l'impossible, or Attempting the Impossible, which suggests, I think, the sort of the futility, right, or the impossibility of ever capturing a real life, tangible flesh and blood object of desire in anything as insubstantial as a flat canvas and empty. So the other, this is another work from 1928 that's um, installed very close to the Antonin work. It too pictures a couple, but in a radically um, different way. It's probably one of the more violent and disturbing pictures in the show. A lot of Magritte's early work is, is quite dark and it's quite violent. And I think that as you go through the show and the blue skies enter in, um, it becomes a lot easier to, to, to look at, but there is that, that undercurrent of violence. This is a work that reminds us, um, as maybe I said at the beginning, Magritte, he not only liked mystery movies, he liked mystery novels, he liked detective stories, uh, he liked Edgar Allan Poe. And so what you're looking at here is a picture of, of two figures with um, superimposed within a single silhouette. So with this exaggeratedly um, muscular nude female form and then a clothed male that, that attacks her. And Magritte himself and others since have written about this work in terms of the image it presents of a, of a woman threatened. But I think at the same time, when you look at it, to, to think about what Magritte has done to the man's body at the same time. It is far more radically cropped and distorted and truncated than, than um, the woman's. And in fact, that right arm of hers pushes out, right, towards, towards his shoulder, introducing this uh, wedge of space into a picture that otherwise could read as being quite flat. So once again, subverting the laws of um, pictorial I know you're all so quiet and I'm just talking, so I hope. <laughs> if you, if someone feels like interrupting me and commenting, you know, I know what I made. Well, I made you laugh again, so that's good. Uh, or he made you laugh, right? Because I think this is probably, I think from what people say and what gets reproduced, this is probably the most famous picture in the show. Um, it's called The Treachery of Images or Ceci n'est pas une pipe. It's probably Magritte's um, most famous critique of representation. And I think one of the reasons that is so is because it, I can't think of any other artist who is just 
so funny and he makes pictures that are just so just laugh out loud and kind of dumb and simple and at the same time that are that are philosophically profound because at the time I mean now maybe it could be thought of well yes of course a picture of something is never the same as the thing itself but at the time Magritte made this that wasn't um, something that was a given and I think even even now um, it's worth being reminded of so Magritte here of course he gives us this exceptionally clear, bold, legible image of a pipe, and then equally clearly, boldly, and legibly underneath it, he tells us, well, but this, this is not one. And then that way undoes, right, any sort of natural connection between a name of something and the picture of it. Later on in life went on, or when he was looking back at this moment, or what should I say? You know, I mean, of course, the model he's looking at here is a school primer. So if you think back to you know, the books that you read your, your kids or things that you read when you were, were little, right, of the apple and there's, it says apple underneath it. This is a, a riff on that. And Magritte and his friends love to spoof things like grammar books, lesson books, but to turn the meaning around. So to try to shock people out of, of um, accepting, accepting rules and conventions in a passive way. So anyway, he later on in life, he went on to say, well, who could smoke a pipe from one of my paintings? Nobody, so obviously it's not a pipe. So this is um, another work that might be known or is, or is another um, one of the more familiar pictures in the It's called The False Mirror. It's another painting that like the image of the pipe or the treachery of images is all about the idea of seeing and believing, and how can Magritte mess around with that a little bit? So the title is one that was given to it by his friend, Paul Nuget. He often asked his friends to name his pictures. He thought the titles had a very important role to play. He wanted to be sure, he, he described them as adding an added layer of protection against people seeing things too, too simply. And I think in this work, the, the idea of a false mirror refers on the one hand perhaps to the idea of a painting being a, a false or an imprecise or an imperfect reflection of reality and also to the way that human vision or sight is so subjective. You know, what we see it, it is always determined by who we are, what we're interested in, where we're standing and all the rest. So it is not um, in, infallible or objective in any way. So. What you're looking at here, of course, is on another hand, this riff on the idea of framing. Um, you are invited to look through this oversized and really rather peculiarly, how do I say, strangely, strangely lashless eye, like you're looking through a window. And at the same time, that eye stares right back out at all of you. The surrealist artist and photographer, Man Ray, so probably a number of you know that name too, was the first owner of this picture. And uh, he sold it to MoMA in 1937. So it's one of the very first Magritte's to enter our collection. And Man Ray memorably described it as a picture that it itself sees, right? It looks as you at you as much as it is seen, sort of capturing that duality of this being a picture that um, you, you Oh, so this is just, right, um, this is one of the more better known, I guess, um, appropriations of Magritte's images by, by um, in this case, the television company, CBS, owned by William Paley, a great patron of MoMA. And Magritte was asked rather late in life, in 64, what he thought about this. And he said, well, you know, this really had nothing at all to do with his painting. What they had done was simply to put a shape on a background. It had become nothing but a symbol, whereas his picture was all about poetry. It had absolutely no pragmatic function. It wasn't trying to sell you anything. It wasn't a brand. It was just making the world look good. So moving on through, through the show, this is one of three very um, unusual pictures. Magritte 
described them as toile découpé, or cut-up paintings that he made in 1930. And here I'm showing you the one we began with. It's called The Eternally Obvious. He also talked about these cut-up pictures as objects. And there are several early photographs. This is one of them where he positioned this work of art in strange scenarios. And for the surrealists, they were very interested in, in object making as a means of infiltrating reality, right? As putting things, strange, strange things out there to make, to make your world um, uncanny and unfamiliar. So what you're looking at is, again, it's another image of Georgette Magritte painted in five individual parts. I think Magritte's very interested in, I've said framing, but here to think about camera vision, right? And that idea of, of when you focus, it occludes other, other parts of the body. So that showing us five discontinuous separate images that in fact don't add up to any one continuous whole. And we know from sketches and from that photograph I showed you before that from the various very start, Magritte imagined or he wanted these, these paintings, these five individual frames were to be mounted on glass with these precise gaps in between them and so that the viewer would be encouraged to complete the picture in their mind. And his friend Muzet wrote about this work in terms of the way that vision is discontinuous. you begin to look at each of the different panels, you can see that the top three are shown from one vantage point. By the time you get to the knees and the feet, it's as though you're looking down on them from above. So again, this idea of not having a seamless, idealized whole. It's like Magritte taking on probably one of the most um, you know, traditional motifs in, in Western painting, the female nude, and reinterpreting it. In So this is uh, one of the last pictures that Magritte painted in Paris. We're now in 1930, and he um, was scheduled to have a one-person exhibition. So he painted this very big work called The Annunciation, where you can see uh, motifs that have shown up in some of the earlier pictures, the paper cutouts, the bilboquets on the right, those silvery round spheres in the background. He referred to as grelots or sleigh bells. All here, you have to imagine the picture is very large given this unprecedented sort of monumental form. And he said he made this first one person show in Paris, but two weeks before that show was scheduled to open, his gallery went bankrupt and his dealer's girlfriend ran off with someone else and Magritte's show was canceled. And he ended up having to go back to Brussels. Um, he couldn't make a living anymore in Paris. And that was the end of this sort of remarkable three-year period there. He returned to Brussels, and he never left Belgium again for the rest of his life. But during those three years in Paris, when we've been looking at a lot of pictures from him, he made more pictures, and he made more radically different pictures than at any other moment before. Or afterwards. So Magritte, uh, he goes back to Brussels because you also have to remember, you know, the, the United States the stock market crashes in 1929. There is a, a worldwide economic depression, and Magritte suffered from that, just as many artists of his time. So he goes back to Brussels, and he has to make a living as a commercial artist for a couple of years. He opens a studio called the Studio Dongo. And I think I forgot to mention at the beginning that one thing that is special about Magritte's background is that he was trained both as a commercial artist, as a graphic artist, and as a fine artist. So he went to the academy and to an applied art school. And I think that the way that his images are so bold and clear and legible and identifiable um, and, and graspable on first glance has so much to do with his coming out of a 
a graphic arts background. And then, of course, the irony is that he goes on to have his works and his very unusual um, types of images reappropriated again by the by the advertising industry. But anyway, so he's back back in Brussels and he's running the studio Dongo for a couple of years and then late in 1932 he has what he later described as an artistic breakthrough. And this came about as the result of a nocturnal hallucination and he described how one night he woke in a room where a splendid misapprehension caused him to see an egg in a cage in the place of a bird. And he memorialized um, and preserved for posterity the shock of that vision in this collective affinities. And for him, this represented a breakthrough because up until that point, he had always sought to, to provoke shock, to, support, to provoke surprise, to provoke this sense of something being awry with the world by juxtaposing different things, like a, a jockey in a forest with chess pieces. And from this moment forward, he decided to set himself the project of creating images that revealed hidden affinities between things, like an egg and a cage, like in this um, disturbing <laughs> and direct image of uh, uh, like uh, similarities between a woman's body and her face, or between a picture and a window, as in the National Gallery's human condition that you see here. And Magritte liked to say to people that the, the canvas that you see pictured in the painting covered over exactly the segment of the landscape right, that you see depicted on it. But of course, the minute you really begin to look at that, the very idea that there is any difference between what is within that rectangle that is designated picture in a picture and what is outside it as landscape is just a, 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 a false dualism because the entire picture, of course, is this painted imaginary confection um, with courtesy of Rene Magritte. Okay, now we're looking at Magritte making surrealist objects for real. 30s, these are first, as I said before, the surrealists um, were very engaged with the idea of object making increasingly in the 30s. They saw it as a mode of art making that everybody could practice. You didn't have to have any particular skill. It was a matter of the potential of everyday objects in the world. So what Magritte did was um, with these two found plaster casts, one of the Venus de Milo on the left and the other of Napoleon's death mask on the right. So he uh, polychromed them with some of his own signature image clouds in the sky on the right. And throughout the 30s, so this is um, not a great slide, but it's a case with examples of Magritte's um, surrealist objects because one of the goals of the show was to show not only familiar paintings but unfamiliar ones and to show the diversity of Magritte as a, a surrealist artist. So as someone who made collages, there are many and also Magritte and he continued to contribute to the surrealist object exhibitions throughout the 1930s and this is a work called This Is a Piece of Cheese uh, that was his contribution to the 1936 Surrealist Object Show at the Gallery Charles Raton in Paris. And Magritte submitted just the little painted picture of cheese that you see there. It was up to the exhibition's organizers to complete the work by finding the cheese dome or the cake dome. So as in the last gallery of the exhibition, as I said at the beginning, are a number of works that Magritte uh, created for Edward James. And James invited Magritte to come live with him in London in 1937. So Magritte moved there and stayed for six weeks. And there, James had commissioned him to create three monumental paintings for his ballroom. And the one that we're looking at, the red model, 
is one of those works. You have to imagine it's a very, very big painting. It's eight feet high. Um, and of course, the motif continues Magritte's longstanding interest in this idea of, of metamorphosis and in helping us to recognize or sharing his uh, discovery of hidden affinities between things, in this case, um, the human foot and that which we cover it with are our shoes. And when you see this in person, the um, Pink Floyd illusionism of those feet and the veins um, make this a particularly discomforting um, image because you start to think about the way that he has, in fact, conflated living and, and And maybe I can point, let's see if I can move this down. So draw your attention to this detail that he added in the lower right hand corner. It is shown close up. So Magritte added there this um, image of a torn newspaper clipping that has a, a um, you know, it's a, a reproduction of his own work, Titanic Days, that we looked at earlier. The, nude woman with the closed, clothed man attacking her. So it's like leaving this little calling card or um, a reference to self in lieu of a signature or another way of thinking about how Magritte consistently is reappropriating his own imagery, putting it in different contexts, making it mean other things. So these are also two works that are in, in, the, in the last gallery of the exhibition. Magritte described them as portrait manqué, or anti-portraits, failed portraits. They are both of Edward James, but of course, um, unlike a traditional portrait, you are denied any sense of what James himself looked like. So even though both of these are based on photographs, the one on the left, in fact, on a photograph by Man Ray, that he took of James according to Magritte's specifications and the one on right based on a photograph that Magritte took of James with his back to him. In each case, Magritte um, denies the face on the left by obliterating it in a burst of light. So when you see it in person, it's almost granular the way that there's this, this explosion of light, which you would think of as light as something that helps you to see, but taken to an extreme here, of course it's blinding. And then on the right, you see James staring into a mirror that gives us back not his face, but the back of his head. About the same time, the little book that you see in the lower right-hand corner, which is an Edgar Allan Poe book, who was uh, one of Magritte's very favorite authors and who was among the first to introduce the idea of the double or the doppelganger into literature as a character for the first time. Anyway, the book is shown conventionally reversed in the mirror. So again, there are two different systems of operation at work in the same picture. And I think this work on the right, which is called Not to be Reproduced, I always think is a work that so beautifully encapsulates many of the different themes that you see throughout the exhibition, this idea of doubling and repetition or mirroring and concealment as ways of defamiliarizing the familiar or making everyday, ordinary, recognizable objects um, indelibly memorable and strange. So to conclude, I'm just going to pretend that you have walked through the exhibition with me and you've now turned around and you're about to leave. And this is the, the view. Um, of course, when there are lots of people there, you don't quite get that. So let's pretend that this is your, your special visit. This is the view that uh, visitors, I hope, get as they leave the show. What you can see here, it's an exhibition where you have to e exit the same way that you've entered. And so what I wanted to do in installing it and choosing where I was going to hang the pictures was to put all the most famous ones on the back wall so that you wouldn't really see them until you left because I wanted people to see the less familiar works by Magritte on entering. And then when they turned around and saw the pictures, they knew, hopefully, to be able to see them anew or afresh or in a different way because they're in the So Magritte's uh, friend, 
Paul Nugent wrote in 1931. He said, you know, to look at a Magritte painting and then to turn around and look at the world again, find that the world has been altered. There are no longer any. And I hope that if Magritte's paintings have worked on everybody who comes to see the show as he intended them to, that our visitors too will turn around and go out into the world again and see ordinary objects and think about Magritte's extraordinary painting in a little bit of a different way. For those of you who haven't been to see the show yet, I hope you will come and for those come back and thank you. Happy <laughs>